You are all welcome, and if you're watching these videos to relax or fall asleep, please consider subscribing before we begin. If you get carried away watching the videos, please take a moment to introduce yourself or simply say hello in the comments. Also, if you haven't liked and subscribed yet, it means a lot to me. It's incredible to see people from all over the world tuning into the video. Thanks again to all of you. Remember to turn off the lights, pour yourself a glass of water, and make sure you lock your doors. It's okay to lie in bed and close your eyes. It was about a year ago during the summer when I was 19. I was still living with my folks, just out of high school and cruising around in my first car, a used Honda Civic. This particular night, I was driving home from hanging out with some buddies in a neighboring town. It was close to midnight, and I was about 15 minutes into my drive, not too far from home. The road I was on was kind of remote, not quite a highway but a single lane each way with a decent speed limit. There were a few streetlights here and there, but it was mostly just me and the road. I was tired, struggling to keep my eyes open, and couldn't wait to hit the sack. Then, up ahead, I saw this guy standing by his car, hazard lights flashing. He looked like he needed a hand so I slowed down and pulled up beside him. He seemed relieved when I rolled down my window, so I asked if he needed help. He was about 50, wearing a plaid shirt and glasses, looking pretty normal. He asked if I could give him a lift to the nearest town, but I wasn't about to do that. Instead, I offered to call for help, but he seemed a bit agitated by that. As he got closer to my car, I discreetly locked the doors, and that seemed to set him off. He tried to force his way in, reaching through my window to unlock the door. I panicked, slammed the gas pedal, and took off. I glanced back in my rearview mirror and saw him sprawled on the ground, and I hoped I hadn't hurt him too bad, but I didn't stop to check. I drove straight to the nearest gas station, called the cops, and told them everything. When the cops checked out the spot, there was nobody there. No broken down car, nothing. It was like the guy and his car had vanished into thin air. It sent shivers down my spine. I never found out what that guy's deal was, but I'm just glad I didn't stick around to find out. Since then, I've been keeping an eye out for any news about similar incidents, but so far, nothing. It's like the whole thing never happened, but I know it did, and it still gives me the creeps just thinking about it. It's been bugging me ever since, wondering what that guy's intentions were. I mean, was he just trying to hitch a ride? Or was there something more sinister going on? The thought of it keeps me up at night sometimes, especially when I'm driving alone on those dark, empty roads. I've become hyper-aware of my surroundings whenever I'm out on the road now. Every time I see someone pulled over with their hazards on, I hesitate before stopping to help. It's like that one encounter has made me question everyone's motives, even when they seem harmless. And the fact that the guy was never caught adds to the mystery. Was he just some random creep, or was there something more organized going on? Maybe he's out there somewhere, waiting for his next unsuspecting victim. I try not to let it consume me, but it's hard not to dwell on it. Every time I hear about a similar incident in the news, my mind goes back to that night. It's like I'm trapped in a never-ending cycle of paranoia and fear. But I guess all I can do is stay vigilant and trust my instincts. And maybe, just maybe... One day I'll find out the truth about what really happened that night on the road. Until then, I'll keep my eyes peeled and my doors locked. You can never be too careful out there. My name's Jake, and this messed up thing went down when I was a senior in high school. I'm from West Tennessee, where we don't usually get a ton of snow, but when we do, it can really mess things up. So, this one time... We had snow on the ground, but the school decided to stay open anyway. I mean, seriously, it wasn't safe out there, but they thought it was no big deal. After school, I went over to my buddy Mike's place, and we were just chilling, playing some video games. When it got late, I figured I should head home. Now, the roads had gotten a bit better, but there was still some ice lingering around. As I'm driving home, I make this turn out of Mike's neighborhood, and suddenly... This car comes speeding over this blind hill, almost rear-ending me. I felt bad for pulling out in front of them, but they were going way too fast for the conditions. They honked, I waved, and I tried to shake it off, 
But here's where things get weird. That car that almost hit me? Yeah, they started tailgating me, brights blaring like they were on some kind of mission. I started to panic a bit because it felt like they were following me. So, I started taking random turns, hoping to lose them, but they stuck to me like glue. I figured maybe if I sped up and then made a sharp turn, I could lose them, but I hit a patch of black ice, and my car slid right into a ditch. And wouldn't you know it, those jerks stopped too. Next thing I know, they're dragging me out of my car and beating the crap out of me. I was curled up on the ground, screaming for them to stop, but they just kept laying into me. Finally, they got back in their car and took off, leaving me bruised and shaken. I managed to call my mom, who told me to call the cops. They showed up, but I didn't have much to tell them. Just that these two guys in a sedan had followed me and then jumped me when I crashed. To this day, I still don't know who those guys were or why they targeted me. But one thing's for sure, if I'd just gone straight to the police station instead of trying to shake them, maybe things would have turned out different. The whole ordeal messed me up pretty bad. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched or followed, even when I was at home. Every car that passed by made me jump, thinking it might be those guys coming back for round two. I started having trouble sleeping, replaying the attack over and over in my head. I felt so helpless, lying there in the ditch while they kicked and punched me. And the worst part was not knowing why they did it. What did they want from me? Was it just some sick thrill? I tried to go back to school, but I couldn't focus. Every noise in the hallway made me jump, thinking it might be them. I was paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder, wondering if they were watching me. My parents were worried sick, and I could see the fear in their eyes every time they looked at me. They wanted to help, but there was nothing they could do to make me feel safe again. I thought about going to therapy, but I was too ashamed to talk about what happened. I felt like I should have been able to handle it, like I was weak for letting it get to me. But the truth is, I was scared out of my mind, and I didn't know how to cope. Eventually, things started to get better. The bruises healed, and the nightmares became less frequent. But I'll never forget that feeling of terror, knowing that at any moment, those guys could come back and finish what they started. I don't know if I'll ever truly get over what happened that night. But I've learned to be more cautious, to trust my instincts, and to never underestimate the darkness that lurks in the world. I've been working as a cab driver for about five years, and this story takes me back to around 2010. It was late fall, and the rain was coming down hard. I remember the gloomy weather well. I was driving through the city streets, the wipers swishing back and forth, trying to keep up with the downpour. Despite the rain, it was a busy night, and I was making good money. But the weather made the road slippery, and I had to be extra cautious. I'd picked up a few passengers already, including a couple of guys from a downtown bar. They were heading to a rough part of town, and I was eager to drop them off and get out of there. As I drove, I noticed a figure standing on the curb, trying to flag me down. It was a tall man, drenched from head to toe. I felt sorry for him, so I pulled over to offer him a ride. He got in without saying much, and I started driving, assuming he'd tell me where he needed to go. But the guy was silent, lost in his own thoughts. I stole a glance at him in the rearview mirror and noticed a scar on his jaw. It gave him a rough appearance, and I couldn't help but feel uneasy. When we reached the east side of town, I asked him where he wanted to be dropped off, but he just stared at me. Then, out of nowhere, he pulled out a gun and demanded everything I had. My heart sank as I handed over my wallet and keys, praying he wouldn't hurt me. He kicked me out of the car and sped off into the night, leaving me stranded in the rain. I stumbled to a nearby diner and called the police, shaking and soaked to the bone. The cops arrived quickly and took my statement, but they never caught the guy who robbed me. My car was found abandoned in a ditch miles away, and my wallet was never recovered. It was a terrifying experience that still haunts me to this day. I'll never forget the feeling of helplessness as I watched that man drive away with everything I had. It's a reminder that danger can lurk in the most unexpected places, especially on dark and rainy nights like that one. Days passed since the incident, 
but the fear and paranoia lingered like a stubborn shadow. Every time I got behind the wheel of my taxi, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread, constantly scanning the streets for any sign of danger. The rain continued to pour, adding to the oppressive atmosphere of the city. It felt like the world was closing in on me, suffocating me with its darkness and uncertainty. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, haunted by the memory of that gun pointed at my head. But life goes on, they say, and eventually, I had to muster the courage to get back on the road. It was a slow process, each fare filled with tension and anxiety. Every passenger that got into my cab felt like a potential threat, their innocent faces masking hidden dangers. I tried to push through the fear, reminding myself that not everyone was out to get me. But the paranoia gnawed at me, whispering in the back of my mind, reminding me of what could happen if I let my guard down. Then, one rainy night, as I drove through the deserted streets, I saw him. The man who had robbed me, standing on the corner, his sinister grin cutting through the darkness like a knife. My heart stopped, my breath catching in my throat as I stared into his cold, calculating eyes. But this time, I didn't freeze in fear. This time, I was ready. With a surge of adrenaline, I slammed on the gas pedal, determination fueling my actions. I wouldn't let him win again. I wouldn't let him haunt me any longer. As I sped away into the night, leaving him standing alone in the rain, I felt a sense of liberation wash over me. The fear that had gripped me for so long began to loosen its hold, replaced by a newfound strength and resolve. From that moment on, I vowed to never let fear control me again. I may have been a victim once, but I refused to be a prisoner of my own paranoia. As I drove through the rain-soaked streets, I knew that no matter what dangers lurked in the shadows, I would face them head-on, with courage and determination. This happened a couple of years back when I was still grinding as an Uber driver. I mostly worked the night shift in my town, which ain't exactly the safest place after dark, you know? Anyway, it was one of those misty, eerie nights when the fog rolls in and everything feels kinda off. Around 11 p.m., when I was thinking about calling it a night, I got a ride request from someone named Jake. It wasn't too far from where I was, so I figured, why not? I pulled up to the pickup spot, and this dude, Jake, hops into my back seat without saying a word. Hey, Jake, I said, trying to be friendly, but this guy just sits there, silent as a grave. Whatever, I thought, maybe he's just not in the mood for chit-chat. The destination Jake entered was some weird set of coordinates out in the boonies. Red flag, right? But I shrugged it off and started driving. As we got farther from the city lights, I couldn't shake this feeling that something was off about Jake. Then, we reached this deserted spot out in the middle of nowhere. There was just one creepy-looking house in the distance, surrounded by trees. I pulled over, and Jake got out without a word. Just as I'm about to breathe a sigh of relief, I hear the rumble of an approaching truck. It pulls up next to me, and before I know it, Jake's smashing my window with something. Glass goes flying everywhere, and I'm freaking out. I slam my foot on the gas and peel out of there like my life depends on it. Which, let's face it, it probably did. I call the cops, but by the time they show up, both the truck and Jake are long gone. Back in the safety of the city, I finally let myself process what just happened. Some people are just plain crazy, man. I count my lucky stars that I got out of that situation with just a broken window. It could have been a whole lot worse. I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that lingered long after the incident. Every time I hit the road for another Uber shift, I found myself constantly glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting Jake to reappear out of nowhere. The nights grew darker, and the mist seemed to thicken, casting an ominous shadow over the city. It was as if the darkness itself was conspiring against me, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Then, one chilly evening, it happened. I picked up a passenger named Sarah, a young woman in her early 20s. She seemed friendly enough, chatting away about her night out with friends. But as we drove deeper into the night, a sense of unease crept over me. 
We reached a desolate stretch of road on the outskirts of town, and Sarah suddenly fell silent. I stole a glance at her in the rearview mirror, and that's when I saw it. The same cold, vacant look in her eyes that Jake had worn. My heart began to race as Sarah directed me to a secluded spot, far away from any signs of civilization. I knew then that something was terribly wrong. With trembling hands, I reached for my phone, ready to call for help. But before I could dial, Sarah's demeanor shifted. Her eyes glinted with malice as she turned to me, a wicked smile spreading across her face. In that moment, I realized I was trapped, alone with a stranger whose intentions were anything but benign. With a surge of adrenaline, I floored the gas pedal, determined to escape this nightmare. The engine roared to life as I tore down the empty road, leaving Sarah behind in a cloud of dust and uncertainty. I didn't stop driving until I reached the safety of the city limits, where the warm glow of streetlights welcomed me home. But even as I stepped out of my car, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped a fate far worse than a shattered window. From that night on, I vowed to trust my instincts and never let my guard down. For in the darkness of the night, there are secrets that lurk just beyond the glow of the streetlights, waiting to ensnare the unwary. And I, for one, refuse to become their prey. It was back in 2005, when I was in my early 20s, grinding away as a taxi driver while juggling my studies. Late shifts were my bread and butter, the only way I could make ends meet. After dropping off my last passenger for the night, I set off towards home. There was this new housing development along my route, all posh and upscale. During the day, it buzzed with activity, but at nearly 2 a.m., it was dead silent. Just piles of lumber and deserted machinery scattered around. The neighborhood backed onto a dense forest, adding to the eerie vibe. As I slowly drove through the construction site, a figure emerged from the shadows and ran up to my window. I jumped, quickly locking my doors. The guy looked clean-cut, probably in his mid-forties, but he was petrified, tears streaming down his face. He begged to be let in, saying something about not having time and someone coming for him. My instinct screamed danger, but against my better judgment, I cracked the window open to hear him out. Please, sir, please let me in. I have money, he pleaded, his voice trembling. Is there someone I can call for you? I offered, trying to keep my cool. No, there's no time. He's coming, the man cried, panic written all over his face. I hesitated, torn between helping him and protecting myself. Too many horror stories of taxi drivers being attacked flashed through my mind. In the end, I chose caution over compassion, telling him I'd call the police instead. But as I drove away, his cries for help echoed in my ears, haunting me long after. I went straight to the police station, feeling guilty and scared. Days later, I saw his face on the news. The man who had begged for my help, found dead in the forest near where I left him. They said it was an animal attack, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something more sinister was at play. The guilt gnawed at me, leaving me with unanswered questions. Who was he running from? Why was he being chased? And the most chilling question of all, is whatever it was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike again? The incident left me rattled to my core. Every night, as I navigated the city streets, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The memory of that terrified man haunted my dreams, his desperate pleas echoing in my mind. I became paranoid, constantly checking my rearview mirror, expecting to see something lurking in the darkness behind me. Even the smallest noise made my heart race, my nerves on edge. I tried to push the thoughts aside, convincing myself it was just my imagination running wild. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister was lurking in the shadows. Then, one fateful night, it happened. I was parked in a dimly lit alley, waiting for my next fare, when I heard it a low, guttural growl emanating from the darkness. My blood turned to ice as I peered into the abyss, searching for the source of the sound. But there was nothing there, 
just the eerie stillness of the night. I tried to convince myself it was just a stray dog or a trick of the wind, but deep down, I knew better. Whatever had taken that man was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike again. From that moment on, I lived in constant fear, always looking over my shoulder, afraid to let my guard down for even a moment. And as the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being hunted, that I was next on its list. It was back in September 2020 when I went on a trip to Germany with my family and friends. We're pretty well off, like, ridiculously rich, especially my uncle who's a billionaire. So, I had my own slick ride, a 2020 Lamborghini Aviator SV, because why not, right? Anyways, while cruising on the German Autobahn with my cousins David, Luke, and Werner, who also had their fancy supercars, we noticed something weird. David who was driving a Ferrari SF90, suddenly vanished from the group. Like, one minute he was there, and the next, poof, gone. We freaked out, obviously. I mean, how does someone disappear while zooming at 250 kilometers per hour? It didn't make sense. So, we did the only logical thing. We turned our cars around and went looking for him. We even ventured into the woods next to the highway, calling out for David. But here's where it gets really freaky. Every time we heard his voice crying for help, it sounded like it was moving farther away from us. It was like he was there, but not really. And trust me, it sent shivers down our spines. We searched for days, but found nothing except David's Ferrari, completely intact, as if nothing happened. It was like he vanished into thin air, leaving behind his car and all our unanswered questions. The whole thing spooked us to the core. Even now, in 2022, I still can't shake the feeling of dread. It's like something out of a horror movie, but it really happened. And the scariest part? We still have no idea what happened to David. Years have passed since that eerie night on the Autobahn, but the mystery of David's disappearance still haunts me. Despite all efforts, no trace of him has ever been found. It's like he vanished into thin air leaving behind only questions and a lingering sense of dread. Sometimes, when I'm alone at night, driving David's Ferrari, I can't help but wonder what really happened to him. Was it some sort of glitch in reality, a freak accident, or something more sinister? The uncertainty gnaws at me, eating away at my peace of mind. I've heard all sorts of theories over the years, from alien abductions to supernatural occurrences, but none of them provide any real answers. The truth is, David's disappearance remains one of the greatest mysteries of my life. But amidst the uncertainty, one thing remains certain. I'll never forget the chilling sound of his cries for help echoing through the darkness, haunting me to this day. And until the truth is uncovered, I'll continue to hold on to hope that one day, we'll find out what really happened to him. I remember that night like it was yesterday, even though it's been a few years. I was driving back home from a friend's place out in the country, just like I often did. We lost track of time, as we usually did, and it was well past midnight when I hit the road. Now, the thing about the road to my house is that it's dark. I mean really dark. No street lights, no nothing. Just you, your headlights, and the eerie silence of the night. It's the kind of darkness that can play tricks on your mind if you let it. So there I was, cruising along, when I saw him. A man standing by the side of the road, waving at me with a friendly smile. Normally, I wouldn't think twice about stopping for someone, but this was different. It was late, I was alone, and he was a stranger, but he seemed harmless enough. So I pulled over and rolled down the window. Hey there, ma'am. Sorry to bother you. But could I trouble you for a ride into town? He asked. His voice is smooth as butter. I hesitated for a moment, but then I figured, why not? People in the country help each other out, right? So I nodded and told him to hop in. We chatted for a bit as we drove, and he seemed like a decent enough guy. But then, out of nowhere, he dropped a bombshell. I'm terribly sorry, ma'am, but I'm going to need to take your car, he said. 
his voice calm but firm. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. What are you talking about? I asked, my heart racing. But before I could protest any further, he pulled out a gun and pointed it at me. My whole body went numb with fear as I realized what was happening. I didn't argue. I just got out of the car and watched as he drove away into the night, taking my car and my phone with him. It took me a while to find help, but eventually, I flagged down a police car and told them what had happened. They said the guy matched the description of a wanted criminal who'd been robbing people at gunpoint in the area. I couldn't believe it. The man who seemed so polite and friendly had turned out to be a dangerous criminal. It made me question everything I thought I knew about helping others. But in the end, I realized that you can't let fear dictate your actions. You still have to be kind and compassionate, but you also have to be smart about it. You never know who might be hiding behind a friendly smile. After that night, I couldn't shake off the feeling of betrayal and vulnerability. It haunted me, making me question every stranger's intentions and second-guessing my own instincts. I felt like I had lost a piece of my innocence, my trust in humanity shattered by one terrifying encounter. But as time passed, I came to realize that while caution is important, I couldn't let fear consume me. I refused to let one bad experience define how I interacted with the world. So, I started taking self-defense classes, learning how to protect myself and stay safe in uncertain situations. I also became more vigilant, always aware of my surroundings and trusting my gut instincts. If something felt off, I didn't hesitate to walk away or seek help. And while I still believe in helping others, I've become more discerning about who I extend my kindness to. Despite the trauma of that night, I've learned to find strength in adversity. It's made me stronger, more resilient, and more determined to live my life on my own terms. And while I'll never forget what happened, I refuse to let it hold me back. So, to anyone reading this, remember to stay vigilant, trust your instincts, and never let fear dictate your actions. Life is unpredictable, but with courage and resilience, we can navigate its challenges and emerge stronger on the other side. After that harrowing experience, I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread that lingered. It was a few years ago, back in September 2018, when I was leaving work late one rainy night. I worked at a fast food joint on the outskirts of town, a good 45-minute drive from my place. Despite the long commute, I stuck with it because, well, a job's a job, even if it pays peanuts. The rain had turned the roads into a slippery mess, and visibility was poor. As I made my way through the rural part of town, I noticed there weren't many cars around. I let my foot off the gas a bit, trying to navigate the wet roads cautiously. Suddenly, I saw a pair of red brake lights up ahead. I hit the brakes hard, but it was too late. I rear-ended the car in front of me as it was turning onto one of the country roads. I knew I messed up big time. My heart sank as I pulled over, knowing this was going to cost me. The other driver didn't come out right away, so I waited nervously in my car. When he finally emerged, I could see he was bleeding from a cut on his face caused by the accident. But instead of being angry, he was oddly calm about it all. It's just a scratch, buddy. Don't worry about it he said, dismissing the damage, but I knew better. I insisted on calling the police, which seemed to set him off. He got aggressive, invading my space and pressuring me to back down. With his demeanor and the fact that he was armed, I felt like I had no choice but to comply. As he drove off, I made sure to memorize his license plate, a gut feeling telling me something wasn't right. When I called the police, they ran the plate and discovered the car was stolen, linked to an armed robbery. It sent shivers down my spine, realizing I narrowly avoided a dangerous situation. But I knew I had to do my part to help catch this guy. So, despite being exhausted, I went to the police station to give a description. It was a scary ordeal, one that made me question my trust in strangers and my own judgment. But it also taught me the importance of staying vigilant and trusting my instincts, even when things seem off. And while the monetary cost of the accident was steep, it paled in comparison to the potential danger I avoided that night. 
as I sat in the police station, recounting the events of that terrifying encounter, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that gnawed at me. The officer taking my statement listened intently, jotting down notes as I spoke. It was comforting to know that they were taking the situation seriously, but I couldn't shake the lingering fear that the man might come back for revenge. After giving my statement, I returned home, but sleep eluded me. Every creak of the floorboards and rustle of the wind outside made my heart race. I couldn't shake the image of the man's face, his calm demeanor contrasting sharply with the underlying threat he posed. The days that followed were filled with a sense of paranoia. I found myself constantly checking the locks on my doors and peering out the window at the slightest noise. My once mundane routine felt like a game of survival, with every stranger I encountered sending a jolt of fear through my veins. Despite my best efforts to move on, the trauma of that night lingered like a shadow, casting a pall over every aspect of my life. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the man from the accident was lurking just out of sight, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Months passed, and with each passing day, the fear began to fade. I tried to convince myself that it was all in my head, that I was letting paranoia get the best of me. But deep down, I knew that the threat was real, that the man who had terrorized me that night was still out there, biding his time. Then, one evening as I returned home from work, I noticed something out of place. The door to my apartment was slightly ajar, a cold draft whispering through the crack. My heart pounded in my chest as I cautiously pushed the door open, ready for whatever horror awaited me on the other side. But to my relief, the apartment was empty. There were no signs of forced entry, no indication that anyone had been inside. I searched every room, every corner, but found nothing out of the ordinary. It was as if the whole thing had been a figment of my imagination, a manifestation of my deepest fears. But as I lay in bed that night, the feeling of unease returned with a vengeance. I couldn't shake the sense that I was being watched, that the man from the accident was still out there, waiting for his moment to strike. And as I drifted off to sleep, the sound of approaching footsteps echoed in my mind, a chilling reminder that some nightmares never truly end. Back in the early 90s when I was about 18, something really creepy happened to me. See, I was super into cars back then, and I had this sweet 1979 Z28 Camaro with T-tops. One summer evening, my friend Jenny and I were cruising around the main street of a neighboring city, just looking for something to do. As we were driving, I noticed this small red truck following us from a distance. At first, I didn't think much of it, but then I realized it had been tailing us for a while. I mentioned it to Jenny, and we both started feeling a bit uneasy. I tried to shake the truck by pulling into a driveway, but it just pulled in a few car lengths behind us. We tried a few more times, but it kept following, always staying the same distance back. Getting creeped out, Jenny and I decided to head towards home, thinking the driver would give up. But he didn't. He just kept following us, and it was getting late. We didn't want to lead him to our homes, so I suggested driving to the nearest police station. But then Jenny did something crazy. She grabbed the steering wheel and veered the car sharply to the right, nearly causing us to crash. I was freaking out, trying to keep control of the car, while Jenny insisted we couldn't go to the police. As we waited at a red light on a one-way street, the truck pulled up next to us. And that's when I saw him. The guy from the truck was standing outside his car, completely naked. It sent shivers down my spine. I floored it when the light turned green and we sped away, but the guy kept following us. We drove all over town, trying to lose him, until finally we managed to shake him off in the countryside. When I saw the news a few weeks later about the police searching for a guy in a small red truck, I couldn't help but wonder if it was the same creep who had been following us that night. It still gives me chills just thinking about it. The whole ordeal left me shaken, and I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease for weeks after. Every time I got behind the wheel, I couldn't help but glance nervously in my rearview mirror, half expecting to see that red truck following me again. Despite the lingering fear, 
I never told my parents about what happened. Maybe I didn't want to worry them, or perhaps I was afraid they wouldn't take me seriously. Either way, it felt like my own dark secret, one that I carried with me wherever I went. As time passed, I tried to put the incident behind me and focus on my day-to-day -day life. But every now and then, I'd catch myself wondering about that man in the red truck. Did he ever get caught? And if he did, what was his motive for following us that night? Even now, decades later, the memory of that terrifying encounter still haunts me. It serves as a constant reminder to trust my instincts and be vigilant, especially when out on the road alone at night. Because you never know who, or what, might be lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike.